Hi there everybody, hope you're all well. Not in my usual filming setup, I am enjoying a rare weekend away up in the wilds of the northeast, enjoying the wilderness and catching up on a lot of reading and writing. And on the note of reading and writing, I'm here today to talk about this book. In my view, Samuel Shem's House of God is one of the greatest medical books ever written. It's a hilarious, dark, very deeply cynical story that it follows a group of interns in America around a hospital as they try to get to grip essentially with becoming young doctors and it's, it's one of those medical coming of age tales essentially no sleep lots of very hard work always on call and it's set in the 1970s and it captures a time when medicine looked very different to how it looks today it was less evidence-based comparatively speaking much more baptism by fire and a time when the word well-being probably thought to be a form of malingering but I recently reread House of God for probably the fourth or fifth time. And while it's true that I think a lot of what's in the book and the attitudes therein are outdated and they, they wouldn't be in keeping with societal attitudes today, it is shocking how prescient some of the observations within it remain, how true to life the rules of the house of God still are today. And on that note, even if you haven't read the book, I'm sure that many people watching this will at least recognize the laws of the house of God as preached by the infamous fat man in the book, the sort of gleefully subversive senior resident that all of the young doctors are learning from. And throughout the story, he delivers the 13 laws of the house of God and becomes very much a mentor to the main character, although certainly not a sort of morally unimpeachable one. In this video, I'm going to revisit the 13 laws of the house of God and attempt to translate them into modern medical parlance and to try and decide whether they remain clinically relevant today or they've fossilized into a sort of gallows humor type scripture for the chronically disillusioned. Law 1 of the house of God Gomers don't die. GOMA, or get out of my emergency room, it's an acronym. It doesn't really refer to the worried well in the book, people who, who don't really have a reason to be in the emergency department. Quite the opposite in the case of House of God. A GOMA is the patient who's so chronically unwell and so riddled with disease that they exist in this sort of liminal medical state. They're too sick to get better, but also too stable to die. And so they come back again and again and again to emergency medicine and acute medicine with this sort of Sisyphean cycle of readmission. And, and this is something that you sadly see, unfortunately unfortunately in the UK, where social care and community care are so chronically underfunded that patients just ricochet back to hospital over and over because they're not able to be managed properly and safely in the community. And there's a bit of a bleak commentary in there somewhere on how often the instinct with medicine is, is to do something right, to do more rather than less and simply prolong the inevitable, when the reality is for, for this group of patients, which Samuel Shem is calling a goma, it doesn't really matter how much medicine you do to them, they will not get better. So unfortunately, I think this concept very much still exists. It may always exist. Law 2. Gomers go to ground. From this height, if a gomer goes to ground, it is an automatic intertrochanteric fracture of a hip and a turf to orthopedics. This height is called the neurosurgical. Going to ground from here results in the turf to neurosurgery, and from there, they rarely bounce back. I'm going to be using this phrase a lot, but this is a very bleak commentary on the epidemiology of the elderly, essentially. They fall, they break, they bleed, and then, as is relevant to the book, they become someone else's problem. In the book, they talk about the idea of a turf, which is the act of handing a patient off to another specialty. And then you can often find yourself embroiled with these patients in this weird game of hot potato between different specialties, and often, as, as the early careers, the resident doctor, the SHO, you are caught in the middle of these turfing attempts between the different specialties. But there is a glimmer of wisdom amidst all this, which is that falls are both common and dangerous. That's the important point. They are catastrophic a lot of the time. And the cascade of things that follows a fall can be very difficult, very messy, and very complicated. And one of the most important things we can do in medicine and healthcare is making sure that people don't fall. Law number three. At a cardiac arrest, the first procedure is to take your own pulse. 
one of the simpler and I think more elegant laws. It's not metaphorical either. Literally check yourself because taking your own pulse in the context of a cardiac arrest, which is this massive sort of adrenaline filled, complex, loud situation, taking your own pulse under those conditions is a form of primitive sort of mindfulness, I think, because often in the chaos of an arrest, the most dangerous person is the person who panics. It's a reminder that your heart is still beating, you're okay, your hands are still working, and fundamentally your presence is still required. As it was explained to me by a consultant on one of my busy jobs, the patient may be dead, or nearly so, but you're not, and you have a job to do, so act like it. Law number four. The patient is the one with the disease. This is, I think, in some ways a gentle slap in the face. It's very easy to become absorbed, I think, in, in your own suffering as a doctor, the sort of tiredness, chaos, loss of control over your life, these very existential things. But fundamentally, it's the patient who is ill. It's more complex, though, and the longer you go, and I realise that I'm saying this as someone that's only been qualified for four years, but you see this from people that have been working in healthcare for a long time. That boundary between people who are ill and the people that are looking after them, it's not as robust, I don't think, as any of us would like to think. Doctors get sick, doctors get depressed, and you see some incredibly dysfunctional behaviour from healthcare professionals that clearly is part of a coping mechanism for what's going on, what's wrong in their lives, and what's affecting them, and, and people need help. The point is to some degree medicine and health it damages its own and if, if you read Samuel Shem's follow-up book which is called Mount Misery um, he, he explores this idea in a bit more detail. The fifth law of the house of God placement comes first. This is another one that's still really prescient. Before doing anything to cure the patient where are they going next? What is their placement? What is your exit strategy? Is it going to be back home, a care facility, another hospital? Again, in the UK, really, really important thing to consider because working in the NHS, this becomes this great epic logistical quest. Working out, is someone going to be transferred to another hospital closer to home, but there are no beds, so you can't. So they stay in hospital and then they decondition and then they can't go home. So now they have to go to a step-down unit or a care home when so much of this suffering could have been saved with a more sensible discussion at the beginning. A one of the most, I think, emotionally devastating things you can have is a failed discharge. You know, someone's been sat medically fit for discharge for weeks on the ward waiting for things to be sorted at home and then they're sat around so long that they develop a chest infection and now they can't go home and then the package of care has been cancelled. This is one of those terrible, terrible things that still happen. And I know it's a trite thing to say, but it's just because the whole system is not joined up in such a way that you can have any form of actually sense-making planning. Law 6. There is no body cavity that cannot be reached with a 14 gauge needle and a good strong arm. And I think in the book, the line is only sort of half joking because it, it was referring to the old school mentality of procedural aggression, essentially. If something doesn't look right, prod it with a needle and see what happens. And, and again, running throughout the book, there's this fairly grim implication that the gomas are practice material, a means of refining technique on the people that are so unsalvageable that you're preparing yourself to be better for the people that your interventions could actually help. Thankfully, we now have a few things like consent imaging, guilt. But I think there is also a broader point here about being decisive. Sometimes decisive invasive action is necessary. And if you hesitate too long to do something, the opportunity to help someone might be lost. And as doctors, obviously that consideration is important, is what tools do we have available? What can we do? And who's going to make the decision to commit and actually do something? Law number seven. Age plus BUN equals Lasix dose. It should go without saying, this is not a real formula. <laughs> Please don't use it. At least as I interpreted this from the book, it's it's a bit of a satirical take on how medical decision making can, can often be reduced to formulae, and not, not even formulae, but rules of thumb. What they're talking about is BUN, blood urea nitrogen, it's a crude measure, right, of renal function. How well your kidneys are filtering waste products from the blood. Lasix is one of the brand names for fruzamide, which is a, a diuretic 
diuretic medication, the medication that makes you pee more, which we, we commonly give to people who are fluid overloaded, make them pee out the fluid. The law is effectively saying older people with dodgy kidneys need a higher dose of Lasix, of the medication, to get the fluid off. Fundamentally, it's not good medicine, but I think there's something in there about how tired, stressed, busy doctors like the senior resident in the House of God, they're operating off heuristics and habits rather than thinking about the needs of the individual patient. The eighth law, they can always hurt you more. Now they, in this context, means anyone, whether it's the patient, your co-workers, the management, the nurses, the families, whatever. It's a pretty grim reminder that no matter how bad things seem in the current moment, that things can always get worse. And I remember one really grim, grisly cardiac arrest I was called to in my first year working as a doctor. I was really troubled by it at the time. I, I didn't really know how to process what had happened. It occurred to me that I, I should maybe sit down and try and collect my thoughts. And I went and found a secluded side room, lights were off, I could sit down and try and piece everything together, only for the cardiac arrest bleep to immediately go off again. And then obviously straight back into the fray, no chance to process anything. To, and it's a, it's a reminder that sometimes you just don't get that opportunity to, to decompress and make sense of things. And I think that that repeated, untreated injury and stress is probably what contributes to a lot of burnout that we see in healthcare staff, not just doctors, but these tiny sort of micro tears, single incidents that compound and get worse and worse and worse over time. It wouldn't surprise me at all if that was what was leading to a lot of fatigue, burnout, moral injury that we see. Law number nine, the only good admission is a dead admission. And this is, this is just sheer burnout. There's not a lot more I can say about this one. The dead generally don't decompensate, they don't need antibiotics, they don't need future escalation plans, they don't need difficult conversations. Every living patient, to some degree, to a very tired, burnt out and overworked doctor, is, is a living, talking bundle of risk and responsibility that someone has to deal with. Some specialties admit more of the dead than others, obviously. If you're in minor injuries, you'll probably come out of things all right. If you've been admitted to neurosurgery, then chances are that things have already gone quite badly for you. But again, obviously, importantly, Every patient is a unique person with their own situation, well-being and needs that need to be taken into account. And every patient has the right to expect that treatment and consideration from their doctors. The 10th law of the house. If you don't take a temperature, you can't find a fever. There are two ways that you can interpret this law, I think. The first is that if you don't investigate properly, you can't ever find out what's wrong. The second way, and I think probably closer to what Dr. Shem intended, is that if you don't go looking for problems, then you don't have to deal with them. It's a, a sort of medical equivalent of Schrodinger's cat, except the cat in that case has neutropenic sepsis and you'd rather simply not know about it. I think the modern, slightly more ethical version of this that we can apply to practice today is you're thinking about ordering a, a test of any kind, whether that's a blood test, a scan, an investigation, whatever. Do not do it unless A, there is a clear reason to do so, and B, you are capable of interpreting the answer and you know what you would do with the answer, whether it's either normal or deranged in some way. This is all to do with Bayesian statistics, probability theory, decision making, etc, etc, which I will do a whole video series about in the future, but that's a nice simple place to keep it for now. Law 11. Show me a BMS who only triples my work and I will kiss his feet. In the book, BMS refers to best medical student, the supposed cream of the Harvard crop, as they have Harvard medical students on rotation where the book is set. But in the context of the book, they are not helpful. They slow you down, they ask questions, they require teaching, and they need pastoral care. Obviously, in other words, they are students. They need and are entitled to all of these things from the doctors that are looking after them. And on those really, really bad days where you're already stretched past your breaking point trying to manage a million things, even a really well-meaning student can feel like an anchor under those circumstances. Teaching well, I think it's worth saying, is hard. Teaching while you're overburdened and crumbling is nearly impossible. And it's one of the very many ways in which teaching in the NHS and my own teaching and probably most doctors teaching needs to improve. The system that we have is not set up to provide good teaching.
teaching for our students, but we're relying on them to become the doctors of the future, the ones that will be looking after us. We have a duty, therefore, to teach them well, to be better doctors than we are. And teaching students is one of the one of the things that I hope to try and do well through my medical career. I don't always get it right. We do try. Law number 12. If the radiology resident and the BMS both see a lesion on the chest X-ray, there can be no lesion there. This one's a bit more tongue in cheek and the, the point isn't that the medical students or the, the radiology residents, the registrars are incompetent. The point is, is that they are eager and stressed and too anxious and so people have a tendency to overreach and overread into things and diagnoses that aren't there and you sort of see this yourself i've done this myself if you have a group of medical students and you show them a picture of a normal chest x-ray one or two of them will come out with positive findings and the shadowing nodules imagined masses and this is important again for us when we're managing people's care because in some senses it's easier right to to think that you see something and then and that means you get to do something, you get to intervene, you get to make a treatment. It is often much harder to be able to say with confidence, no, there is nothing there and I'm not going to take any action. Because diagnosis, I guess after all, the art of diagnosis includes the ability to say, no, this is normal. But actually being able to say something is normal and there is no pathology here, one of the hardest things in medicine to be able to do because you're shouldering responsibility for that decision not to do anything. The 13th and final law of the house of God. The delivery of medical care is to do as much nothing as possible. Possibly the most subversive of all of the laws of the house of God and equally possibly the most true. This is not a new idea, by the way, by any stretch of the imagination. There's an old Voltaire quote, right? That's how old this idea is, that the art of medicine consists of amusing the patient while nature heals the disease. And when you think about it, in the grand scheme of things, the human body is astonishingly good at fixing itself if given the chance and the conditions to do so. And not only that, but the more you intervene, the more you have the chance to make things worse. Every pill, every scan, every operation, everything we do in medicine, every intervention we make carries some amount of risk. And just like being able to say diagnostically there is nothing going on here, doing nothing properly, intentionally and with full awareness of the decision you're making to do nothing, I think is one of the hardest things to do in medicine. It's certainly not something that I'm capable of doing yet. Maybe that's the point of medical training, to one day get to the place where you're comfortably able to make the decision to do nothing and not operate. But that wraps us up. Ultimately, right, the House of God is not a textbook, obviously. It's a satire, it's the screams of a young doctor muffled under a few layers of sort of cynicism, black humour and dry wit. But one of the things that I will say for this book, despite all of its flaws, is that it carries truth still and a lot of it is unpalatable and difficult to hear. But sometimes, as I do think is the case with this book, the advice is timeless. And whether the laws all still apply is, is kind of up to your point of view. Have we moved on, do you think? Or are we simply a bit better at smiling while the hospital tries to break us? I don't know. But what I do know is that I'd like to hear what you think. Let me know which of the laws still rings true for you, or which ones you think should be rewritten for the modern NHS. Thank you very much for watching, guys. Be sure to hit the like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe, and don't forget to go and check out the website, ollieburton.com. Take care, and I'll see you next time.